Why, hello, and welcome to America Learns. I'm joined here today with my good friend, Daniel. All right. So, uh, hey, folks, you may have watched our first video on the beginnings of the war in the Pacific Theater. Uh, but like I said uh, in the previous video, uh, a beginning is a very delicate time, or it's a very delicate thing. So now, uh, of course, in the first video, we talked about how the various European powers were colonizing uh, islands and nations in the Pacific, on the continent of Asia. And of course, it's leading up to a horrifying conflict or future conflict that will soon follow. And now we're going to be focusing on the empire or what will soon be the empire of Japan. And we're going to talk about how the uh, Meiji Restoration turned Japan into the empire that we saw in the Second World War. So uh, without further ado, I think it's important we put up the video. Before we start, Daniel, is there anything you would like to add? No, I think this is good. I think based on the video we saw previously, I think we did some good commentary. I'm really excited to see what we can add to this. And I'm really excited to see especially what you have to say about this, because I know this era you really know a decent amount about. I, I would say I'm, 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 I am familiar with some of the terms I'll be talking about, and I actually had a chance to visit the uh, Meiji Shrine in Tokyo, which is, was a phenomenal sight to see. Uh, I recommend anyone, if you do have the opportunity to fly out to Japan and visit Tokyo or at least get a chance to be around the Meiji Shrine, uh, please do so. It is filled with a lot of great information that I never knew about. And I just want to say this. This is has nothing to do with the Kings and Generals video that we're going to be reacting to. I did not like Meiji's portrayal because after reading about him and who he was, I do not like his portrayal in the film The Last Samurai. There's no way he was that soft or or quiet. He he was he wasn't uh, indecisive or oh I can't tell my no the guy knew what he was doing. The guy I, I did not like his portrayal of the Last Samurai. I'm sorry. There we go. Anyways, anyways, let's go ahead and pull up this video and get started. <laughs> In the first half of the 19th century, Japan was an agrarian country of tens of millions of rice farmers, a small minority of merchants who benefited from their hard work, and the elite class of samurai, who as peace continued, exchanged their swords for calligraphy brushes, working in a variety of administrative positions. Both the farmers and the samurai were indebted to the merchants, and this, coupled with increasing peasant unrest and foreign interventions, threatened to destroy the status quo of the Tokugawa shogunate. And yet, almost four decades later, the Japanese Empire established itself as a regional power in the Far East, going so far as to defeat the Russian behemoth. How did Japan achieve this? How did it undergo such a transformation from a poor isolationist state into a modern military powerhouse? Yeah, pause it right there. Answer all these questions. It, it, right. I know they're going to go into it. It's just another question, but it is an amazing. It's um, the transformation of Japan from feudal peasant system mm -hmm. to an industrial power took a one per took a lifetime, whereas in Anywhere in Europe, it took four or five lifetimes. And the only right. thing I can think of that's comparable to that level of transformation is what China would go under in somewhat-ish similar circumstances, different uh, between the U U.S. and Europe making it the industrial hub of the planet. That's true. And, and, and again, can you imagine being born in a time where, you know, you're a child and, you know, you're, there's a, you're living under a feudal system and you see it transform into this modern industrial uh, superpower? Um, it must have been a sight to behold. And it just happened within a blink of an eye. And it's really incredible um, just how quick uh, Japan went from a isolationist country to a, what would be at a time a global superpower. Yeah. ...and talk about the Meiji Restoration and the Russo-Japanese War. Come closer to your screen and let me tell you a little secret. A secret about a hidden gem that costs you nothing. Uh, it was a... Okay, so yes, we could learn about a hidden gem, but we're here to get our learn on. So there you go. That's why we're called Americans Learn. 
small minority composed of merchants and artisans that was fundamental in the fall of the Tokugawa shogunate in the 19th century. This minority was despised by the Japanese class system that followed the precepts of Neo-Confucianism as they sold rice and cash crops in commercial centers and lent great sums of money to samurai and daimyos. For the shogunate, taxation of commerce was inconceivable because it would give prestige to the merchants and would lower the status of government. Positive. This state of affairs often... I always yeah. found that absolutely hysterical, that concept. I don't under, maybe I don't understand why it got to that point, but just the idea of we're not even going to tax them because that would give them legitimacy. Well, you know, I, I I would compare it towards how a lot of the ruling families in in Europe, uh, some of the medieval uh, fiefdoms, the you know, and the dukes, the lords, the kings, you know, a lot of them were illiterate. A lot of them were unfamiliar with trade and economics, and you know, a lot of these royal families, these nobles, were broke and indebted to a lot of merchants in in Europe, for example. So I would compare that to how maybe how the samurai and the lords over there viewed their merchant class you know it's it's just a, I, I think you're, you're you're in a position that was handed to you from your father from his grandfather to or from his father and his father's father and, and all that so a lot of these noble families it's it's inconceivable to really acknowledge anyone that's more self-made or who actually built their own wealth whether it's and, and not have it handed to them so it's like you know, you have dynastic families in power, which again, it's 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 ego on their part, but they're not acknowledging the hard work and dedication from a lot of the merchants and uh, you know uh, traders that are able to build themselves up. And the thing is, it, it, it to your point again, it's pretty funny, like how a lot of these lords, not only in Japan but even in Europe, would come crawling and begging these same merchants and traders for money. Hey, please give me money. Can you recognize us? No. <laughs> And then they would just go, okay, we have the weapons. We're not paying you back. Ha-ha. <laughs> yeah, but see, the thing is, though, uh, eventually that wouldn't even work either because, you know, when you have one – or when you have a couple of lords indebted to you, hey, do you want me to uh, lower your debt? This one guy's not paying me. Get him to pay me back the money, and I'll oh, lower yeah. your debt. I mean, it's just that simple. And it's like, oh, really? Okay, great. Yeah, sure, no it's problem. It's crazy. The favor system hasn't changed at all. Nothing has fundamentally changed at all, period. ...and left the treasury empty and forced the shoguns to debase the coinage to pay debts, thus causing inflation. And as the impoverishment of the samurai put their loyalty in question, the government risked a fully armed insurrection. But it wasn't just the class system that brought the collapse of the Japanese state, an increase in foreign intervention contributed harshly as well. Since the year 1633, the shogunate had strictly regulated commerce with foreign countries, especially European ones, issuing their Sakoku isolationist policy. But at the start of the 19th century, Russian explorers arrived in Sakhalin and the Kuril Islands, foreign whalers started to navigate oh, Japan's positive. waters, and a British so mm -hmm. I've learned that those islands that they're talking about are still in dispute to this day between Japan and Russia. Oh, of course. Yeah, still to this day. And uh, it's it's just should show you that even though even in the video is going to talk about the uh, Russian Japanese war. I mean, that war that took place over 100 years ago, I think, at this point, uh, still impacts the people of future generations and still disputing that those islands so there you go british gunboat even threatened to attack nagasaki in response to these persistent visits the shogunate issued in 1825 an order to expel by force any foreign ships in japanese waters a policy that was supported by the japanese population experiencing a general sense of distrust and paranoia towards western powers after their actions in the opium wars Meanwhile, the United States was expanding its presence in the Pacific, sending the shogunate a number of proposals to establish diplomatic and commercial relations. Because the Japanese refused each time, Positive. Commodore Matthew Perry arrived in... Yep. ...from uh, Bill Wirtz. Open the country. Stop having it be closed. 
Yeah, open it up. Come on, we want to talk to you. And then, of course, here is again Matthew Perry, a uh, Commodore of the United States Navy, who led the expedition. And uh, when those ships arrived, I think they gave like a warning shot because they were first going to be um, opposed by the Tokugawa Shogunate uh, Navy, their, their Navy at the time. And uh, they, they just gave a warning shot. I was like, oh, okay, never mind. Co come on in. Come on we in. We didn't build up our mil we didn't build up our Navy like that. What are we going to do? <laughs> <laughs> Japan in 1853 to enforce trade with the United States. The Japanese population was alarmed, and the Shogun, Tokugawa Ieyashi, knowing that war was futile, sought a compromise. The Americans succeeded in opening trade with the Japanese, and soon the Western powers pressed their advantage in a series of unequal treaties that further opened commerce in the region. Oh, yeah, this so left Japan in a semi colonial Go ahead. It was, uh, I was listening to the video a while back. Have you know the channel like Voices Through History or Voices in the Past or something like that? I have never heard of them. Please oh, tell you, me. you would love it. It's um, basically a channel where they find old diaries or letters or correspondence with mm -hmm. people from a long time ago. So like they like chronicle like the uh the mission sent by Japan of sending people to negotiate with the Pope, which got lost in history. Um and I forgot where I was going specifically with uh this one, but it'll come back to me. But it, it's keep keep playing it. I, I think oh, 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 you're, where you're probably going to get to is Voices of History is like uh, there were people who wrote in their diaries about what it was like living during this time in Japan. Yeah. So, right. That was it. Thank you. It was when this was happening. They had firsthand accounts. Thank you. Of people that were going through this and the officials and what they were thinking. Mm -hmm. And it was specifically the person that the that was actually communicating with Perry, trying to get trying to talk to them. Mm -hmm. And. Effectively, what they were saying was that the the you know how like when Europeans like want to do a peace treaty or whatever, they open up like a ridiculous opening offer mm -hmm. that like always is supposed to get negotiated down through negotiations. Right. When Europe started doing that, the unequal treaties, Japan never countered with another offer. They just accepted. Oh, no. So the unequal treaties were because Japan and because in Japanese culture and the way that they had done diplomacy, the offer you're given is the offer you get. Oh, my god. And goodness. so with America and everyone else making the offer, it's like, OK, let's negotiate a little bit. We're not going to give you a lot, but we'll negotiate this down a little bit if you give them if you give us a good. Because that's how that's how the West negotiates. It's a negotiation right. mm -hmm. and it'll. The strength of your negotiation is based on how much power you can project, sure. Yeah. But it is a negotiation, and Japan never negotiated. Interesting. Colonial status, politically and economically subordinate to foreign governments, making the fall of the Tokugawa shogunate inevitable. As anti-Western sentiment throughout the country began to rally around the Sono Joi movement, which translates as revere the emperor, expel the barbarians, a series of incidents involving attacks on foreign shipping and the assassination of Westerners occurred. In response, the Western powers retaliated with the bombardment of Kagoshima and the occupation of Shimonoseki in 1863. But these actions only strengthened the resolve of the rebels. In the end, the last shogun, Tokugawa Yoshinobu, had no other choice but to approve the restoration of imperial power in Japan. Yet some dissatisfied and rebellious daimyos, aided by the Sono Joi movement, got ahead of Yoshinobu and seized the imperial palace in Kyoto, thus announcing their own imperial restoration in 1868. And for those who don't know, uh, Kyoto was the capital of Japan uh, at that time. So Tokyo, which is now the current capital, was known in this little humble village as Edo. Didn't it? It didn't. Its name literally mean Eastern Capital. Or uh, what, I'm imagining Kyoto, or are you talking yeah. about Edo? Tokyo. Um, that's a very good question. And hey, audience, you in the comment section below, please enlighten us. The Tokugawa loyalists fought against these rebels in the Boshin War, but in the end, they were defeated, resulting in the ascension of Emperor Meiji to the throne. Meiji would quickly go on to issue a series of reforms, increasing the opportunities of commoners, abolishing the class system, 
transforming the feudal domains into prefectures, renaming the capital at Edo to Tokyo, and I'm centralizing the government to into an oligarchy. In, in, and I know you love this guy, but I just want to say... Oh, I do. That, I love him. <laughs> I just want to say on top of everything, that everything that just got listed, an emperor in their lifetime would see as an accomplishment to accomplish one of those things, let alone all of those things. Well, what happened was Meji probably cracked open the book and said, hey, you're the emperor. You're number one. You do realize people answer to you, right? Like, okay, obviously oversimpl oversimplifying it, right? But uh, I, again, visiting the Meji Shrine, there's a lot of uh, important uh, information that's there that tells about the history of Emperor Meji, what he had to go through, and him reforming Japan from being a shogunate to what would eventually become a superpower, it, it is absolutely incredible and really gives a testament of just how powerful he was and how effective he was in getting his policies done, but also leading his administrators to affect his policies. Because you need, because the emperor can only do so much. You need to have competent people who will listen to your commands and get things done. And he and was able to surround himself with intelligent individuals to get his policies done plus you know what, what what's what needs to be acknowledged as well is that his wife also played an important role in reforming japan because what she wanted was young women to be involved uh also for uh, women to be educated to learn to read and uh i, I forget the, the term of it so audience batters up right in the comment section below but what she wanted was also to have citizens of japan to go out into the world and learn more about the other countries and bring back what they learned back to japan which is again yeah. incredible and the empress was able to use her own power too and there's a lot of information about her at the meiji shrine like i said if you get a chance to ever fly to japan a place i would recommend is the meiji shrine plus you know just a side note i'm low i'm rambling here but Meji's the kind of guy I would hang out with because he liked to drink red wine, but he also liked to drink whiskey. And there, <laughs> there's a part of that shrine that talks about the various wines he liked to drink and all the whiskeys he liked to drink too. I, I, I of all the people I maybe want to go back in time with to have a drink with, I, I think I'd have a drink with Meji. Yeah, it's <laughs> so it's like a, so that's a that's a yeah and. I think another thing that's, I mean, we have to throw rules for rulers in this somehow. You had an, an existing power structure of the shogunate, mm -hmm. which controlled the military and a military control. It was a, it was a, it was a, it was a monarchical dictatorship of all of Japan. And so when he comes in, he's put in power. And I think also because of the backing of the Western countries helped him do that. And the fact that the, um, the citizens were just so fed up with the shogunate. That's why they got. I mean, then for Japan to oust a shogun is a big goddamn deal. Yeah, uh, and so they all their support went to him. So he, his people that easily put, he surrounds up with the people that he's surrounding himself with. Mm -hmm. um, they're going to be completely different. They're not going to be samurai that he surrounds himself, but I'm sure there will be some. There, there were there were gonna, a few. There were yeah, a few. But, but it's also going to be merchants. It's mm -hmm. also going to be people that are experts in manufacturing I like japan would again japan would like to you know we talked about the um less samurai how it didn't portray him well but the idea that japan was just give us people that can make things i want yeah. jet i want german engineers i want american this british that french this mm -hmm. um they really wanted to be not the country that was suffering to the unequal treaties. They wanted to be a country that could stand equal to the West. Uh, and again, you know, uh, while, while I do find the film Last Samurai to be somewhat entertaining, I mean, let's face it, it's 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 an okay film. I just I really don't like how he was portrayed in it. It's it's a bit of an underservice. And after reading about him at the Meiji Shrine, finding more about him, I'm like, oh, holy cow! I mean, if you were ever to make a film again, you know, and have Meiji use all this talk about yeah. who he was and what he was trying to do uh, whoever yeah, that character it, it, was in the last samurai he couldn't yeah. do a, fr a fraction of what we're learning about here it's like imagine if they if some movie portrayed george washington as the person in last samurai it's about as jarring yeah um 
it wasn't right because so so there we go and i i never knew this until i visited japan in 2020 and i was like oh wow and you like to drink whiskey and red wine oh, all right buddy let's let me do on time travel and hang out with you but anyways let's get back to the video okay the new imperial government would also shift towards a more progressive policy in regards to foreign powers, continuing the modernization of the country, renegotiating some of the unequal treaties, and embarking on a series of military reforms <laughs> sorry, that... But can you go back like uh, three seconds to when they have the picture of the renegotiated? Sure. Uh, no, 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 to 710. Oh, 710? Yeah, right there. Right there. Okay, okay, see, renegotiating, I have an issue with that. I think that should just be negotiating. <laughs> they exactly. never did it in the first place. That's the exactly. whole thing. Exactly, exactly. <laughs> it's like, hey, we can actually negotiate these one-sided agreements that were thrust upon us, huh? <laughs> yeah, you know, yeah, you can actually push back and demand things. ...on a series of military reforms that sparked a variety of samurai insurrections. The new Imperial Japanese Army trained in Western tactics and weapons, easily defeated these rebellions and prompted the end of the samurai class, while the new Imperial Japanese Navy consolidated and modernized thanks to foreign support. The modernized Japanese military saw its first opportunity at being deployed after the Mudan incident. In response to the murder of 54 Ryukyuan sailors at the hands of Taiwanese natives, a punitive expedition was launched in 1874, resulting in the temporary occupation of Taiwan and the official annexation of the Ryukyu Kingdom. A year later, Japan signed the Treaty of St. Petersburg with Russia, in which Japan ceded South Sakhalin in exchange for the Kuril Islands that Russia controlled. The Japanese would go on to colonize the Ogasawara Islands in 1875, the Volcano Islands, including Iwo Jima, in 1889, and Minami Torishima Island in 1898. By the 1890s, the IJA had grown to become the most modern army in Asia, while the IJN had expanded with the acquisition of French and British ships. Tensions with this is all happening under one emperor's rule. Any anyone else, this would take them maybe a, their entire lifetime to even get a fraction of this stuff done. This is how incredible Meiji was. So when I say, you know, when, when I learned more about him and who he was when, on my trip in 2020, and I see how he's portrayed in the film The Last Samurai, I'm like, oh my god, we we'll talk about an underservice and how incredible Emperor Meiji's administration was at the time to get all of this done. A modern navy, a modern army. That's no easy feat to do. But the Qing dynasty had also risen after Japan returned Taiwan to them. But the Japanese successfully pursued their interests in Korea, even despite Chinese opposition. Yet Korea remained inside the Chinese sphere of influence during this time, helped by the Qing dynasty to crush rebellions in the country. All of this, however, would change in the early months of 1894, when the Dongak Rebellion broke out in southern Korea and spread across the country. The Chinese intervened again to defend the Korean government, but the Japanese also did so on the side of the rebel army. Soon, Japanese forces occupied Seoul and established a pro-Japanese... Japan's yep. like, hmm, the Europeans seem to have really good luck with civil wars by backing the side that the other side's not backing as a way to go to war. We should do that too. And of course, then comes the long and horrifying occupation of the Korean Peninsula, which, again, is traumatic and uh, a long, horrifying scar. Japanese government that broke their ties with China. The first Sino-Japanese war had thus begun. For their strategy, the Japanese planned to defeat the modernized Beiyang fleet early on in the war so that they could gain command of the sea and land the 5th Division to push the Chinese out of Korea. While the IGA consolidated its position on the Korean Peninsula and advanced towards Pyongyang, the IJN set out to lure the Beiyang fleet to engage it in a decisive battle. On September 17th, as the Japanese soldiers were occupying Pyongyang, the Beiyang fleet was decimated in the Battle of the Yalu River, and the remains of the Chinese navy would be destroyed later on at Weihai Wei. Having control of the seas, 
the Japanese invaded the Liaodong and Shandong peninsulas, where they managed to occupy Dairen, Lushun, and Weihai Wei, leaving the way to Beijing open and forcing the Chinese to surrender at last. With the Treaty of Shimonoseki, the Japanese Empire annexed the Liaodong Peninsula, Taiwan, and the Senkaku and Penku Islands, and the Chinese acknowledged the total independence of Korea, leaving it inside Japan's sphere of influence. The war had been a great success for the Japanese, yet their gains would face staunch opposition. A rebellion in Taiwan established the independent Republic of Formosa, and the intrusion of Russia, France, and Germany in the Triple Intervention ousted the pro-Japanese government in Korea and forced the Japanese to relinquish the Liaodong Peninsula. Although Taiwan would finally be reconquered after a Japanese invasion in 1895, the Russian Empire soon occupied the Liaodong Peninsula and pressured the Qing dynasty to lease them this territory, as Tsar Nicholas I desired an ice-free natural harbor in the Pacific. Oh, yeah, pause it. The Russians <laughs> Japan's uh, modernizing everything, building up a navy, learning modern tactics, invading, empiring. Meanwhile, Nicholas I is like, I want a warm water port. And of course, the thing is, I know we react to a video previous about the uh, Russian expedition into the Pacific theater um, in order to deal with the war that would eventually come between the Russian Empire and the Japanese Empire. And let's just say, folks, it doesn't end up pretty good for the uh, Russians. Would then go on to build a railway in the region and to rename the city of Lushun to Port Arthur, leaving the rest of Manchuria inside their sphere of influence. But the Russian show of force had an unexpected consequence. The Japanese Empire felt cheated by the Triple Intervention and saw the intrusion of the Russians into what they considered their own sphere of influence as a humiliation. In result, Military and expansionist factions inside Japan were strengthened, forcing the imperial government to heavily industrialize and to build up its naval strength for future conflicts. Japanese diplomacy also sought to avoid another coalition of Western powers against them, leading directly to the Anglo-Japanese alliance of 1902 that protected Japan from the interference of foreign powers and from Russia in particular. Furthermore, since the Boxer Rebellion, most of Manchuria had been occupied by Russian forces that refused to leave the region. Yet the Russian position in the Far East was actually very weak, as the Trans-Siberian Railway was still incomplete, the Russians didn't really know the region, and there was social unrest in Manchuria. So yet again, Russia is having a hard time dealing with logistics outside of their rail hubs. <laughs> <laughs> the Japanese also had spies all across the region, so they knew the way around these lands and estimated in 1903 that Japan's forces outnumbered the Russians in the Far East. This information prompted Meiji to approve preparations for war against Russia, and after the Russian refusal to leave occupied Manchuria, Japan declared war on February 8, 1904. Led by the legendary admiral Togo Heihachiro, the IJN managed to keep the Russian Pacific fleet at bay, while the IJA landed at Chemulpo and quickly occupied Korea, then crossing the Yalu River to start the siege of Port Arthur. Meanwhile, the Russians sent a second squadron from the Baltic and Black Sea fleets to reinforce the defenders at Port Arthur. Oh, the... one. Yeah, oh, so this isn't the, the this other... This is coming from the Mediterranean. The one that we're talking about came from their uh, cold water port. Right, okay. Anyways, uh, I, I still can't forget how that fleet managed to epic end. <laughs> but the long journey across the Atlantic and Indian Oceans caused them to arrive too late, as on January 2nd, 1905, Port Arthur surrendered after most of the Pacific fleet was destroyed by an inland bombardment. Not only did the 2nd Pacific Squadron arrive late, but they also arrived in a very poor condition due to the necessity to get to the Pacific as quickly as possible. At the same time, the IJA advanced through the rest of the Liaodong Peninsula, occupying the cities of Liaoyong and Mukden, 
and essentially expelling the Russian Manchurian army from the region. On May 27th, the 2nd Pacific Squadron attempted to cross the Tsushima Strait towards Vladivostok, but the Russian reinforcements were quickly engaged by Admiral Togo in a defensive battle. The Japanese were spectacularly victorious, practically annihilating the Russian fleet and shocking the Western world with their naval prowess. If you want a more in-depth look at this naval conflict, don't forget to check out our video on the Russo-Japanese War and the Battle of Tsushima. You won't be disappointed. Defeated, Tsar Nicholas continued the war to preserve... They might have just, like, made the fleet come out of the Mediterranean by accident. Um, yeah, that could have been a, uh, maybe an error, but, uh, I, you know, I, I think that because this is Nicholas II, though, um... Hmm. Oh, yeah, yeah, right. yeah. It's not Nicholas III. That's no, right. Or, no, no, N N Nicholas II is the one who was in charge of uh, Russia during the first, uh, what would eventually become World War I. Right, so, right. Yeah, so there you go. Oh, my yeah, yeah, he has that face. <laughs> the dignity of his empire. But the disaster at Tsushima was a heavy blow to the prestige of the Romanov dynasty, eventually leading to the Russian Revolution and the fall of imperial rule. In the last months of the war, Japanese forces also invaded the island of Sakhalin and managed to occupy it with few losses. Nicholas would finally have to concede defeat in August, signing the Treaty of Portsmouth on September 5th, which forced the Russians out of Manchuria, left Korea inside the Japanese sphere of influence, and ceded South Sakhalin and the Chinese leases of Port Arthur and Tallinn to Japan. Although Russian losses had been low, Japan's victory solidified its position as a regional power in the Far East and proved that the Japanese could successfully fight against any Western power. The newfound military superiority of the Japanese Empire also allowed them to establish economic and military dominance over Korea, becoming a Japanese protectorate in 1905 and being outright annexed in 1910. Born from the engulfing flames of Russian battleships, the Japanese Empire would continue to expand through the 20th century, becoming a dangerous threat to Western rule in the East. Next week, we're going to cover how the First World War affected the Eastern world and how Japan initiated its road towards the Pacific War. So make sure you are subscribed and have pressed the bell button to see the next video in the series. Please consider like. All right, so there is a lot to unpack there. I am. I'm happy again, it was. It was a lot. It seemed a lot easier to follow. Like I feel like yeah. both of us sort of know these events pretty well. But if you're mm -hmm. watching the second part, it's a lot easier to follow. It's like it may, the first one's like, okay, here's like a 500 year history of how all of Asia got colonized. Yeah, where the powers broke down, and in Japan, it's like, yeah, and they want to do that too. So uh, I I think I think the reason why the second video was easier to follow, it, it, you know, it, it's in one area and we're following at least one overall uh, rule of Emperor Meiji, how he got how he was able to um, rebuild Japan, turn it away from being a shogunate under the rule of the Tokugawa shogunate and effectively using his power to modernize Japan into an industrial superpower that would eventually take on the Russian empire and start beginning its own quest for global uh, prestige and power. It's, it's like he took it from Japan being used to make money by the West to using the West to make money for Japan. Mm hmm. So uh, so another thing, too, an audience, uh, please type in the comment section below of, of what your thoughts are um, with this beginning video. Obviously, we're, we're building up to what will eventually lead up to the Second World War. Uh, but are, what are your thoughts and what are things that you want to learn more about in regards towards the Tokugawa Shogunate, Emperor Meiji, um, to our viewing audience? If you had a chance to be in Japan or see the Meiji Shrine, uh, tell us your story. Type it in the comment section below. Let's get this conversation uh, started. And is there anything that you would like us to cover here on America Learns? We would greatly appreciate it. All right. So there you go. All right. Well, I'm Kit. This is Daniel. This has been America Learns. Be sure to like, comment, share, and subscribe, and also support the original content creators. Check out Kings and Generals. They do a lot of great work. So take good care of yourselves, and we'll see you next time.